Coming back to the paper session, I'm happy to introduce the chair of the paper program together with Jack Wells, uh, Sabine Roller from the University of Siegen, Germany. And I will let her tell more about this particular session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Florina already introduced me, my name is Sabine Roller, University of Siegen, Germany, which is about 80 kilometers from Cologne. I'm a mechanical engineer. I do CFD on HPC, but I'm in, within the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering. I have the chair, the professorship for simulation techniques and scientific computing, which shows the interdisciplinary character as also the past conference has. Together with Jack Wells, Jack, maybe you can just raise your hand. Jack from Oak Ridge National Lab, we are the scientific chairs of the past conference 2018. We want to send you a warm welcome to this conference and hope you enjoy three wonderful days in discussions with a lot of new ideas coming from your own disciplines as well as from other disciplines, because this is the focus of PASC, bringing together people from math, knowing the models and the methods, people from computer science, knowing the machines, the software, and especially the software engineering to ensure high quality software, and the people from the application domains, the traditional HPC affine domains, as well as the upcoming emerging domains. And with this goal, bringing together the disciplines, we have set up a program consisting of mini symposia, posters, and papers. Jack and me were supported by our domain chairs, eight domains, two chairs each, supported by a domain committee of three to five committee members per domain. So I'm very pleased to thank all of you. You did a great, great job to put together a very interesting program We attracted about 400 people to attend this conference, which is a great success. The top of the program are the five keynote speeches, one of which you just have heard now, and the paper tracks where, we, um, where the one we start now is a plenary track, and three more paper sessions which will follow tomorrow at 11.30 as semi-plenaries. The mixture of papers and the mini symposia are means to cope with the different cultures in the disciplines, Some disciplines valuing higher journal paper, some valuing higher competitive conference paper. So this conference offers both possibilities, leading to a program which triggers interdisciplinary discussions and foster new ideas. And to that aim, we have selected two papers for today's plenary, the one by Dr. Hatem Latif on extreme computing and extreme adaptive um, optics, the key to finding life outside our solar systems, system and the other by Valentin Clement on abstractions for performance, portable weather and climate models. The two talks are on application as well as on compiler and we hope they bring you to you new ideas within and beyond your own discipline. And with that, I would like to start um, with the introduction of Dr. Latif. Um, so Hatem Latif is a senior research scientist in the Extreme Computing Research Center at KAUS in Saudi Arabia where he is also advising several co students in their master's and PhD research. Hatem received uh, the engineering degree from Polytech Lyon at the University of Claude Bernard Lyon 1 in France, the master um, in applied mathematics at the University of Houston, the PhD degree also at the University of Houston in computer science, so you also have a very interdisciplinary background. Um, in, he was in... Um, in uh, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and now he is at the Kaust University in Saudi Arabia for seven years now. And his research interests include the parallel numerical algorithms, the parallel programming models, and performance optimizations for multi-core architectures and hardware accelerators. He's one of the co-PIs at the Kaust and NVIDIA GPU Research Center Award um, and the Kaust Intel Parallel Computing Center Award, uh, as well as the Kaust Cray Center of Excellence. He has co-authored more than 65 peer-reviewed journal and conference papers. And with that, I'll right. leave you the stage. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. And Basil? All right. Thank you so much, Sabine, for the nice introduction. Uh, a bit of a disclaimer, I'm not an astronomer yet, although you know, I've been uh, working closely with them, and I can tell you it's a very exciting discipline. And I wish perhaps, uh, you know, at some point, uh, who knows, you know, maybe we'll switch to that uh, uh, discipline. Um, so it's a joint work between uh, Dalel Sokari, a PhD candidate at KAUST, um, Olivier Guillon, who is an astronomer from the Subaru Telescope, 
and, and David Keyes, who is the director of uh, the Extreme Computing Research Center at KAUST. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, this extreme computing for extreme adaptive optics uh, you know, application that we are able to deploy on, on an actual uh, up and running telescope located in Hawaii, uh, the Subaru telescope. All right, so here's my outline. Uh, I'll start with some motivation and discuss a state of the art uh, approach to solve uh, some of the uh, numerical challenges uh, required uh, with that application. Uh, mostly, uh, for the most part, um, this is the uh, QR dynamically weighted. A Haley iteration a based a partial SVD solver that is needed here. It's quite long, but hopefully you should remember the, uh, you know, the, 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 the keyword for it, QDWH. Uh, I'll discuss the environment setting because there are a uh, few uh, of uh, new architecture that we have been used to deploy, uh, that we have been using to deploy our application. Uh, we look at then how uh, robust is uh, the actual uh, numerical algorithm that we are proposing. We looked at uh, performance result, and finally, uh, I'll give some conclusion and future work. All right, so um, the Subaru telescope, um, th this is uh, basically uh, one of the flagship telescope of the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Uh, it carries an 8.2 meter uh, diameter telescope. It's quite huge. It's perhaps one of the uh, uh, largest one being deployed uh, on today's uh, you know, uh, on, on ground-based telescope. Um, it contains a high contrast imaging system for directly imaging exoplanets, so planets which are located outside of our solar system. And it operates perhaps uh, the most advanced uh, sort of small HPC facility uh, for the computational astronomy discipline. Right? So it lives at the uh, Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. Um, all right, so this is the, uh, the beast, uh, as I like to call it. Uh, this is, of course, taken at daytime, so the telescope is closed. Um, so the, the, the huge dome will open up at night and uh, will reveal basically the huge, the huge the, uh, mirror so that it can uh, you know, look at those far away uh, galaxies. Um, so I, I said it operates one of the most advanced right, HPC facility. So you know, we're not talking about a huge supercomputer to really run uh, the simulation uh, part on that telescope. We're really looking at uh, a rather small rack you know, of GPUs uh, being deployed, um, you know, eight of them typically. In fact, they are in using gaming cards right now, as of today, uh, to do their simulation. Uh, so this, of course, implies lots of, uh, you know, issues, but, you know, let's not go into that direction. But perhaps one thing to really uh, look at it is, is the, probably the highest in altitude GPU system, uh, you know, at 14,000 feet, all right? So this is a really cool thing. Um, so um, what this uh, GPU system or this hardware resources uh, why is it needed, right? So, and, and why do we need such uh, hardware capabilities deployed on, 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 the, on the telescope? So there are two, uh, two main things when we deal with uh, ground-based astronomy to, to really look carefully. There are uh, you know, the atmospheric turbulence and the optical aberration. Those are two phenomena which comes into uh, you know, the picture and really sort of uh, you know, uh, fuzzy the picture that you would look at uh, you know, from, your, uh, from your telescope. And what happens is if you don't do any, oops, if you don't do any, um, if you don't do any adaptive optics correction to remove uh, those atmosphere turbulence, uh, you know, the, the, the star is fainted. There is absolutely not much to see except, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, picture which is, uh, you know, not, not uh, accurate at all. So when you enable adaptive optics, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, technology that I will explain uh, shortly, uh, you are able to, uh, you know, remove some of those, uh, you know, the impact of those uh, turbulence, atmospheric turbulence. The, the second thing is, you know, you have some aberration coming from the instrument itself, okay? And for that, they use this coronograph to, uh, you know, to remove all those diffraction that you can see uh, around the main starlight. Um, so we'll be re mostly focusing here in this talk on, on, on this uh, adaptive optics, because here this is mostly an instrument which will remove those diffraction. And we'll be really looking at, you know, what is the algorithm, the math, or the linear algebra part needed behind uh, this uh, adaptive optics to remove, uh, you know, from the picture that you have been observing, uh, the impact of the atmospheric turbulence. All right, so uh, this is an, an, astronomy, this is an astro astronomical challenge, all right? Uh, um, so, uh, you know, we, uh, we're talking about removing those turbulence coming from the atmosphere. Um, uh, so we have, oops. 
I get I need to get used to that. So we have that starlight right there, uh, and you know it, it sends uh, its natural light, and then you have those turbulence, which are gonna uh, basically uh, do some diffraction on on, on the on, on the image received by that telescope, and you have something very fuzzy at the end, and you need to remove those turbulence. So uh, you know adaptive optics is really here to do that. Uh, and, and the way it proceeds, um, you know, um, basically we have wavefront sensors being uh, deployed on the telescope, which capture uh, those turbulence, atmospheric turbulence, and, uh, and basically try to model them, all right, so that it can uh, basically remove them from the measurement that that have been taken uh, at real time. Okay, and and the main math, uh, you know, required here, the linear algebra required here is to. Uh, basically generate a control matrix, that's the word they use, uh, the, the terminology they use in, in that discipline, that control matrix is in charge of basically telling each of those um, you know, uh, actuators which form this huge diameter of your telescope, how those deformable mirrors are supposed to tilt to compensate for uh, the atmospheric turbulence. So that control matrix is really the sort of engine uh, of the simulation and operate at the same time uh, the telescope at you know at real time because the uh, uh, you know the uh, turbulence coming from the atmosphere is a phenomena which evolve in time so and that control matrix has to be recalculated uh, close to real time all right so this is something very critical uh, for for the whole simulation uh, and to make sure uh, all those turbulence are fil filtered uh, filtered out uh, from the image so um, okay this is yet another cartoon explaining how this work uh, so you have, again, um, that starlight coming here uh, and it being refracted from this uh, deformable mirrors. And then you have some uh, corrected or correction happening uh, to remove those turbulence out of your pictures. Uh, and, and, you know, you, have, you, you simulate the, this model using this uh, you know, pseudo-inverse linear algebra uh, algorithm. And then you are able to get as output this control matrix which tells, uh, basically, in your next cycle, how those mirror needs to tilt to remove those uh, you know, turbulence coming from the atmosphere. So it's rather a, a rough uh, explanation how this thing works. It's much, much, I mean, it's much complex, uh, more um, uh, you know, uh, complex to, uh, to explain it further down, but uh, that's hopefully the, the main message I would like to convey here. Um, so, all right, and here comes really the linear algebra part, and this is where basically I have my expertise on, and you know, pseudo inverse. This is an, an algorithm which is extremely important here in that uh, in that application. And there are usually two ways of calculating uh, of calculating it. So the first way uh, has numerical issues, uh, which consist in um, looking at your matrix of measurement. Typically, that matrix of measurement is tall and skinny, and what you do, uh, you want to extract from it. Uh, you know, the most relevant eigenvalue or singular values, depending on which method you are using. So for the first method, uh, it's based on, oops, it's based on uh, the uh, eigen solver, and that method initially requires you to uh, build that gram matrix, as we call it. It's basically taking your tall and skinny matrix and, and multiply it by its transpose. The problem with such approach is, if your initial matrix is ill-conditioned, all right, then you know you make your your overall model even. Uh, I mean, you will square that condition number and you make it even more unstable. So the uh, the first approach using an eigenvalue decomposition is not something really appropriate for uh, such application. The second approach, um, which turns out to be more stable, does not have issues uh, with uh, with and doesn't have numerical issues. However, it has of course other uh, you know. Uh, um, other um, negative, uh, I would say, point, but you know, I, I'll, I'll explain why those actual uh, negative aspects are, in fact, uh, perhaps a good aspect to have. Um, so the second approach uses this singular value decomposition. I look at this tall and skinny matrix, I do QR factorization, I reduce that matrix to a squarish matrix, and, and basically I calculate the SVD out of it, the singular value decomposition out of it. So one thing that is extremely also important to remember is for such application, they are really looking into extracting only the most significant uh, singular values. All right? So we're talking about 10%. If the matrix size, let's say, is of the order of 10,000, uh, they are interested in getting only the 1,000 first most uh, you know, uh, significant singular values. So that's something to, uh, to pay attention. And this is, in fact, something that our approach is really able to uh, leverage compared to state-of-the-art approach. 
All right, so what are the state-of-the-art approach? So, um, you know, if you want to do an SVD of a dense matrix, whether it's square or rectangular or, you know, whatever shape it is, typically what you have in LAPAC is you have your dense matrix and you reduce it in that first stage to something more condensed uh, uh, or, uh, you know, to this bidiagonal form. So you start with the dense matrix, you basically reach that condensed form, this bidiagonal form, from which you apply your, um, you know, singular value solver, uh, which is an iterative procedure, and out of it you get your, you know, U sigma V uh, SVD decomposition out of that dense matrix, right, out of that bidiagonal matrix. Once you have that, uh, uh, that decomposition, you can do your, what we call the back transformation, and get back the original singular, uh, left singular values and right sing left singular vectors and right singular vectors, as well as the singular values of the original matrix A. So that's the standard approach. The problem with the standard approach is this, is you know, um, when you look at those stages, they are mostly, mostly being um, slowed down by those level two blast operation, which are really uh, extremely present in, in, in this matrix algorithm. And uh, so much so that, you know, in fact, for instance, if you look at the overall SVD, uh, you will see that those level two blast operation count only for 6% of the entire flops, okay? It's a very small number of uh, operation compared to the overall operation required to do that SVD. However, it counts for 30% you know, of your overall time, of your elapsed time. So those uh, level two blasts are, are problematic. Level two blasts are operation which involve matrix and vector, which basically are really bounded you know, by the memory uh, uh, you know, bus bandwidth, right? So, um, and, and you know, this is really data movement here we're talking about. And this is problematic, right? The, as, all, as all of you know, um, you know, if you look at, uh, from an energy point of view, okay, without going into uh, too much detail, uh, you know, this tells you from 2011 and 2018 how much it costs to do one flop operation, okay, in double precision, and how much it costs to move data at the RAM level, at the local interconnect level, or across the system, okay? And what you can see uh, from 2011, 2018, uh, if you move data uh, across your, your, your memory subsystem at those different levels, you have a, a factor, two or three factor improvement in terms of energy, okay? Uh, however, if you were to do uh, uh, an operation, floating point operation, double precision, uh, we've seen an order of magnitude uh, save in terms of energy, okay? And of course, in this context, in this application, energy matters. Uh, those telescopes are being deployed in isolated places, you can't basically um, expect to have uh, a power plant running just uh, uh, around outside of the door. So, you know, energy is something really important and the uh, uh, astronomers are really looking at it carefully. So, you know, what this tells you basically is, you know, if you were to come up with an, alg an algorithm which do not do too much data movement, however, try to replace those data movement with flops, operation basically, you are on the right side of, uh, you know, the hardware, uh, you know, technology trend. So the big picture, all right, so, uh, you know, what we're trying to do at, uh, at uh, our Extreme Computing Research Center at Chaos is this. We're really looking at algorithms which really have uh, inherently, uh, you know, this, um, this aspect in, in their DNA. The fact that we're trying really to uh, replace or come up with new algorithms, redesign algorithms which do much more flops, perhaps, than, you know, the uh, standard approach. And that's okay, we find, you know, taking that hit. However, we know where the, you know, hardware trend is going and, and we hopefully, we know that we can uh, take advantage of future, and of, of today and future, you know, uh, hardware coming up and, and, and we can really extract performance much better than, you know, the standard approach. And that's what I'm going to show here. So this big picture just show uh, what people do when it comes to singular value uh, uh, decomposition solver, okay, uh, or eigenvalue. I mean, it's a similar concept. Typically, you have, um, you know, uh, the, the, the US and the German, as well as the Japanese uh, approach is, we look at the dense matrix, we sort of transform it to a more condensed matrix. This can happen in, in multiple stages, uh, like in uh, ELPA, uh, using, uh, you know, this two-stage approach. And then once I reach that, uh, basically, uh, you know, condensed approach, so, uh, you know, I'm able to extract the eigenpairs or the singular values, it's the same concept, right? So, but what they do is they try to make faster the existing algorithm, okay? But we know, you know, if your algorithm has, uh, you know, lots of memory accesses, it's going to be a problem moving forward when looking at uh, uh, what is coming next in terms of hardware. So our approach is rather different, okay? Uh, we pay the price in terms of flops. However, we have cool stuff, you know, in our approach uh, when it comes to uh, doing lots of operation, extra operation. But those extra operations are typically very good operation in the sense that 
they either can run extremely in, uh, in, in parallel, um, or uh, in fact they are really based into level three plus operation, which we know, uh, you know can extract uh, performance out of your underlying, underlying hardware very well. And, and that approach is really based on this polar decomposition. That's the, the, main, uh, you know, the main method used in our uh, you know, eigenvalue and, and singular value uh, solvers. And it used divide and conquer algorithm. And you know, it starts with the original problem and divide into sub-problem which are completely, you know, uh, uh, can be run completely in an embarrassingly uh, parallel fashion. And, and, they are, uh, you know, uh, and they are all based in BLAST3 in kernel, which you know, are very well optimized by vendor and, and, and academic uh, people on, on emerging architecture. So we, we basically uh, were able to do that. And, and some of it has already been integrated uh, by Cray in, in their uh, numerical, uh, in their numerical uh, scientific library, LibSCI, for those who are familiar with. And uh, this is uh, something that we are pursuing with them. Um, so, OK, what is this QDWH, right? What is this? Uh, Polar decomposition, uh, which use this QDWH as a method internally to calculate uh, this polar factor. So I have a dense matrix. I basically decompose it, and I want to calculate this UP, this polar factor. That polar factor has very good numerical characteristics that we can really exploit and, 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 and take advantage. So first thing is that it's an orthogonal matrix. So all the operation involved in that polar decomposition are, in fact, you know, relied on... Um, uh, orthogonal transformation, which make really, uh, you know, the overall algorithm uh, numerically stable. All right, so and that's that's something that I want to insist uh, on because you know some of the standard approaches, you know, you may not have that aspect, uh, you know, uh, uh, available. So um, and and that polar decomposition, you know, is very important not only for this astronomy application but also for other operation for other application of interest. Um, so, um, okay, so what I'm doing at, in that, uh, you know, polar decomposition, which uses this QDWH method, it's an iterative procedure. And at each iteration, okay, uh, I basically calculate a QR factorization of, of, of this, um, you know, uh, uh, of this uh, XK plus one, which initially starts with the matrix, uh, original matrix being scaled. And, you know, I do a QR factorization at each iteration with uh, some matrix matrix multiplication. Those two operations are extremely well, uh, you know, implemented, developed, and uh, you know, available for free in well, for free, uh, available uh, to be uh, used from you know all or most vendors, uh, numerical library vendors, uh, and, and that's something very important. All right, we rely on things which are well known in the community, uh, well developed and implemented, and we can really leverage their performance to basically build our overall algorithm. All right. So uh, basically, um, after you converge after, uh, up to six iteration to converge, um, and there is a numerical uh, uh, proof, a theoretical proof for that, uh, which I won't explain here. So you end up getting that UP, that XK plus one, once you converge, it converges to the actual polar factor. So uh, this algorithm, as I said, is backward stable, okay, and it's extremely uh, uh, robust numerically, and, and this is mostly because it uses QR factorization. I have to uh, go a bit faster. And it also, uh, you know, it has this uh, well understood, um, you know, kernel, numerical kernel that uh, we can take uh, advantage, as I said. So this is the sort of code. Uh, you know, what I do initially, I do this polar decomposition, right, using this QDWH. And once I get uh, that polar factor, I'm extracting basically uh, the most significant uh, information from it, okay, which contain, uh, you know, the, uh, the singular value spectrum. Uh, of interest for the application, up to 10%, as you uh, recall it, all right? So basically, I'm projecting, uh, you know, the original matrix to a smaller matrix, which will contain uh, the singular values of interest. That's what the uh, QDWH-based, uh, uh, you know, partial SVD is doing. It's partial because I'm not calculating the overall spectrum. The standard approach today uh, will require to calculate the overall spectrum, and then you will just select those of interest. Here, from the beginning of the algorithm, we, in fact, focus right away only on you know, the uh, singular values of interest. And that's something that you know, gives us uh, good performance, as you would see shortly. Um, so in terms of uh, floating point operation, if you do a standard SVD, it costs you 22 uh, um, n cube, n n cube, uh, with n n being the size of your problem. If you do uh, the QDWH-based uh, full SVD, you calculate the, over, the entire spectrum, right? If you do that, you do twice more flops. Right? Remember, we're doing much more uh, operation. Okay? But you know, one thing that we can, uh, in fact, use or tune in our approach, this QDWH, is in fact just to focus on, uh, a partial, uh, you know, on the partial uh, singular values uh, spectrum of interest for the application. That's something that you know, existing method does not allow you. 
If today you want to get an SVD decomposition and you are only interested in, 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 in a bunch of them, right? Well, you get first to calculate all of them and then just select few of them. So in, in, when it comes to SVD, this is really the, uh, what are the, I mean, this is really the state of the, uh, state of the art approach, how they look at this problem. Um, okay, so environment setting, I'm gonna go quick here, I'm running out of time. We looked at three GPUs, all right? You remember what I said in the beginning that we are sort of uh, putting ourselves in the right side of the hardware trend, and here I'm, I'll be highlighting that. I'll, uh, we looked at three GPUs generation, the Kepler K80, we looked at the P100 and the V100, all right? All computations are done in single precision here because we don't need to do double precision for such uh, application. All right, so uh, uh, I'm gonna show accuracy. You'll have to trust me here, I'll go a bit fast. This is very robust, okay? Uh, this approach is very robust, up to machine precision in single precision. Uh, we looked at the singular value accuracy and the backward errors, which are uh, you know, the usual metric in linear algebra to assess you know, the numerical robustness of your uh, method. And we look at synthetic matrices initially, right? We, we, we just look at generate random matrices uh, with you know, extremely ill-conditioned random matrices and, and try to, to get, uh, you know, uh, get the, uh, some you know, uh, singular values um, out of your spectrum, uh, 7%, 10%, 13%, uh, you know, sort of range, and, and look at performance uh, uh, you know, in a few slides. But in terms of accuracy, this is extremely accurate, and we also applied it on real observational data, right? Data that we got from the Subaru telescope, and we apply, uh, we apply them and look at how, uh, you know, the uh, numerical accuracy is doing. Uh, you know, the backward error here is, is still uh, around the good uh, scope or the good, um, you know, um, range of, of, of accuracy. And, and for the size that we looked at, you know, it seems to work pretty well. Okay, some performance. We looked at true metric, time and, and flops. So time, you know, because it's important. At the end of the day, you want to go as fast as possible as uh, the motto of this conference. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we looked at time, so in seconds, and we looked also at flops, right? Our stuff is, our algorithm is doing lots of dense linear algebra, uh, you know, operations. So it's rather compute bound, and it's important to see, uh, you know, how much your implementation is able to extract uh, out of your hardware. And, and, you know, flops is the right metric for that. So, uh, you know, what we see here for uh, those synthetic ill-conditioned matrices on the K80, right? Um, so on the K80, uh, we get up to 3x speed up compared to the standard approach, to, compared to the uh, magma implementation of, of, of the SVD algorithm. So we get up to 3x uh, speed up compared to it. We reach about uh, 1.8 teraflop in second, and it's 50% of your theoretical peak performance, okay? So if I move now to uh, next generation, P100, you know, we get an even better speed up, right, compared to the standard algorithm, right? Because we're simply taking advantage of, you know, uh, the richness of uh, floating point unit uh, provided by uh, the Pascal GPU. So we get another performance improvement up to 4x here, and we reach 75% of the theoretical peak performance, and we add seven teraflops, right, out of a single uh, GPU. If, uh, if now we looked at, uh, you know, V100, same story, we are again able to widen, uh, widen further uh, you know, the speed up compared to the standard approach, up to 5x here, uh, we reach 9 teraflops, and this is 65% of the theoretical peak performance. Almost there. Um, so we do the same thing now on the actual real data, right? Uh, on the actual data that we got from the telescope, and we get uh, up to 4x speed up here on, on, the, Volta, uh, on the Volta GPU. All right, uh, so conclusion. <laughs> Hopefully I'm on right on time. Um, all right, so uh, you know, I showed uh, here a comprehensive accuracy performance analysis of, of, of this novel QGWH-based partial SVD algorithm. So it's really, uh, as far as, uh, as we know, is the first uh, SVD solver capable of calculating only uh, a small spectra of your uh, you know, singular value decomposition. And this is something very important, in particular for this application. We reported up to 5x speed up on this Volta, um, you know, Volta GPU compared to, uh, you know, um, uh, compared to state-of-the-art approaches. Um, and the real cool news uh, that, we, uh, that I'm happy really to reveal today, uh, you know, this actual code has been ported and run in, in, uh, on the sky on June 24th, so uh, about a week ago. So we have a piece of software um, you know, developed in the middle of the desert, uh, desert in, in, in the Arabic Peninsula being ported in Hawaii at 14,000 feet, so I found this pretty cool. Um, and, uh, you know, we got uh, great results, and, uh, you know, this is still a, a, an ongoing process, uh, and we're happy to have, uh, you know, uh, pushed that barrier uh, further down. Uh, and we have, you know, a further work as well to improve further this uh, method, 
I want to do asynchronous task based and, and try to uh, port it to multiple GPU. And I'm almost done, I promise. I would like to give some acknowledgement to uh, Yuji Nakatsukasa from the National Institute of Informatics, who was really behind one of the uh, main authors behind QDWH, which we then co-developed and co uh, you know, uh, uh, increased performance on, on, the, uh, on the hardware. And, and our three uh, vendors, NVIDIA, Cray, and Intel Parallel Computing Center. I'm, and I promise, uh, this is the coolest thing that you need to <laughs> look at before you know, I, I give it back to Sabine. Um, you know, we've been, in fact, involved for like almost five years now to design uh, uh, you know, the uh, European Extremely Large Telescope. Okay? This is a, a telescope which is yet to be, de uh, you know, to be deployed. It does not exist yet. And uh, you know, this, is, uh, uh, this gives you the dimension of this huge, uh, you know, uh, biggest eye on, on the sky. Those are the small cars. Those are cars. They're not trees. They're small cars. And really give you, uh, this gives you a perspective on the huge uh, telescope. So we've been working with them, uh, Observatoire de Paris, for almost five years. Uh, you know, uh, this gives you how big it is. It's even uh, much bigger than, and complex than the Subaru telescope that we have today. This is the next generation of telescope. Subaru is 8.2 uh, diameter, meter diameter uh, for the mirror. For the uh, EELT, we're talking about 39 meters. So it's, it's really another scale and dimensions. Uh, and this will be located in Chile, in South uh, America. Um, okay, so, you know, it's exciting time really at KAUST because, you know, we, uh, you know, we know that uh, from an historical, uh, you know, uh, uh, point of view, I mean, you know, th this region really uh, has brought a lot in that discipline of astronomy and, and we're sort of trying to bring some of it back home, as, as, as we like to call it. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, this is the beacon for those who have been at KAUST. This is sort of the our Eiffel Tower at KAUST. And, uh, uh, you know, this is the huge uh, ELT which will be deployed in Chile. And this gives you a bit of uh, the size we're talking about uh, of, of this new telescope generation. Uh, at KAUST or at ECRC, uh, we have so many applications to deal with. And we want to map those at so many uh, architecture. And ECRC expertise is really located at the waste of this hourglass, and this is where we can really make an impact uh, on various application. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So we know time is as in grass. Mm -hmm. We have time for one or two short questions. <coughs> yeah, over there. How are your matrices typically for the operation of the optic? Uh, ad adaptive optics? Yeah, so typically uh, right now we're talking about um, uh, roughly 10,000, uh, so 10,000 number of rows yeah. and 100,000 number of columns. So it's really tall and skinny. You have a lot, like an order of magnitude, uh, uh, two order of magnitude difference between number of rows and number of columns. But don't you have to do this in milliseconds? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah. so there, is, uh, there, are, there are two components which are close to real time. One which is really, really close to real time, and one which is not so close to real time. Uh, and uh, the one that I presented here is the one which is not so close to real time. You need to still to calculate it uh, you know, every minute or so. Okay. Oh, there. So a few years ago, the adaptive optics community seemed to be moving towards a customized hardware solution with the digital signal processing, ASIC kind of approach. Um, and that seems to have been abandoned. Do you know what changed? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, um, you know, I mean, clearly there is, um, you know, the linear algebra part to do such simulation is more on the compute intensive part, right? And um, you know, the, uh, the astronomers, when they tried to come up with new models, uh, they were all going towards something much more oriented, you know, in a matrix, uh, you know, matrix-based models, where, you know, all the linear algebra will be plugged in. Uh, in digital processing, uh, I'm not sure what, what are the models they use there. FFT and okay. convolution. And the thing was that this is, because this is an environment where it's a single algorithm, it seems tailor-made for uh, custom hardware which is the approach they were headed toward. I see. So, um, you know, uh, the, what I was familiar with in terms of related work being described in, in this paper here was Monte Carlo. They were using Monte Carlo simulation. Um, I think it was some of it based on FFTs, but it seems to be too slow uh, to converge. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, All right. Adam. Thank you. Um, we have to shorten the discussion now. I think you are available in the lunch sure. break. Mm -hmm. So, thanks a lot. Thanks.